I want to introduce you guys to someone who is a good friend of mine. Now, some of you may already know George, but hey, everybody, this is George. Everybody say, hey, George. Hey, George. Yeah, give him a Hi, hand. Hi, everybody. Give him a hand. So, George, if you've seen him around here, sometimes you've seen him uh, walking around with a camera. He's one of a, he's part of our, he leads our photography team. He also leads our media team. So, um, some of these amazing graphics and stuff, they're all uh, his handiwork. And here's something that you may not know. He's also a pastor, and, um, which makes him a much cooler pastor than me, frankly. <laughs> but all that to say, George is a, just a sincere um, follower of Jesus. He's a guy who, uh, who loves Jesus, loves his word. And George, I've always loved the way that you truly walk the walk and the way that you care for your neighbors and the way that you just care for the people around you. And so I'm just really excited about what God's put on your heart today, and I'd love to pray for you as we get started. Sure. Uh, Jesus, I thank you so much that we get to hear from you today, um, and, and I thank you for all that you've been teaching, George, and as he uh, walks us through um, what you have to say to us today, God, I pray that you just en encourage him, and I pray that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you have for us today, and pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, George. Amen. Well, good morning. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share um, and explore God's word with you. I think that's a special thing, and I, I don't take that lightly. Um, I'm excited to get to call this church my church home and then get to also uh, serve in this way. We've been in the middle of a series called Christian, and we called it that a little bit ironically because kind of what we're arguing in this, in this series is like, Christian isn't a very helpful term. Like, it can mean whatever we want it to mean. Uh, if you ask 10 different people what the word Christian means, you're probably going to get 10 different answers. And so what we're trying to do in this series is kind of redefine that and look at it more through the lens of what does it look like to follow Jesus, to be his disciple, and to kind of take his example seriously as a model for how we're supposed to live as Christians. Um, but before we get started, I, wanna, I know Paul just prayed, but I'd like to ask you to pray uh, with me uh, before we get into God's word together. Dear God, thank you. Thank you that you promise that you are with us when we're gathered in your name. I ask Holy Spirit that you would invade this space, that you would speak through me, that I would be a conduit of your grace and your truth. I ask that hearts would be receptive to what you have to, to say to us, to teach us, and that we would learn what it looks like to be able to just be a follower of you, forgetting the labels, forgetting any stigmas or preconceived ideas to just truly look at you, Jesus, for how we're supposed to live. Now, church, before we finish praying, if you would take just a minute there in your seats to silently pray for yourself. I want you to ask God to open your heart and your mind to what he would have to say to you today. Now, if you would also, just like you just prayed for yourself, take a moment and pray for me and ask that God would speak through me that he would uh, make me a, a vessel of his love and his grace and his truth for you this morning. Well, it's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, thank you so much for praying with me. I know that might have felt a little different uh, but every time I preach, I like to ask us all to pray together to help us be centered on what our purpose is for being in this place. Last week, we learned about John 13.35. And John 13.35 is a really helpful verse, especially for this series, but even more so as a Christian living the Christian life, trying to figure out what does it really mean to follow Jesus, Jesus tells us, John here is quoting Jesus. John is a guy that knew Jesus while he was alive. He followed him around, was good friends with him. And so he wrote a book about Jesus. And in that book, he included this quote from Jesus. It says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So what is a Christian? Somebody who loves 
one another, somebody who loves people, that is supposed to be the identifying trait of a follower of Jesus. But somehow this doesn't always seem to be the way Christians are known. Somewhere along the way, the identifying trait of a Christian has changed, at least in a lot of people's minds. And it's changed to something that looks more like being known for our judgment or maybe even at worst our hate. And it kind of can leave us going, well, where did, how did that happen? Like we're supposed to be a place of, of, of love where we love each other, but, but somehow, some way, there's been this identity crisis for followers of Jesus where sometimes that's just not what we're known for. In the early days of planting a church, I planted a church in Cyprus, and in the early days, I would work out of coffee shops. Uh, And I did that on purpose, specifically so that I could meet people in the community, get to know them, invite them to church, pray for them, things like that. And there was this one guy, uh, he was a manager of one of the coffee shops. And since I worked in his coffee shop like way more times in a week than you even want to know, I started to build a relationship with this guy. And he found out that I was a pastor, that I was planting a church, and was not shy about letting me know that he was not interested in coming to church. He told me that um, he had really been hurt deeply by several churches, and he, he had tried and tried again, and it wasn't that he had a hard time believing what he had been taught about Jesus. It was just that something was, was wrong with churches. That's what he said. And he said what happened was anytime he would go to a church and they found out that he was gay, they would reject him immediately, and he was out. And so he said, I'm not interested. I think you're you're nice, but I'm not coming to your church. I've been there. I've done that. Well, over the next few months, getting to know him a little bit more, eventually he accepted uh, whenever I asked him if I could pray for him. And he said, you know, basically, you know, I'm just having, it's a stressful week at work if you could pray for that. Well, then I asked him, I was like, hey, can I get your phone number? I'll follow up with you. So I followed up with him. And before you know it, we were texting almost weekly about how I could pray for him. And then a couple more months go by, and eventually, knowing what my church taught about homosexuality, he actually decided to come to my church. And when he did, he looked so anxious. Like you could see nervous all over him, and I don't blame him. But after the service, he pulled me aside and he said, George, I was so nervous to be here today. I know that you guys, the truth that you have does not agree with how I live. So I was really nervous to be here today. But I'm really glad that I did. Because I can tell that this is a safe place for me to come with my doubts and with my questions. And everyone was so loving. And I can tell that even though you might not agree with how I live, I'm welcome here. And I've never experienced that before. You see, even though Jesus said that his followers would be known by their love, for my friend, somewhere along the way, that became the exception to the rule. Somewhere along the way, my friend experienced a brand of Christianity that was not loving, that hurt him deeply and actually threatened to push him away from Jesus forever. And that ought to break our hearts. But you know the crazy thing? The crazy thing is that if I were to ask the Christians who hurt my friend, do you think you were loving to him? They would have said yes. And I know that they would have said yes because I've had conversations with Christians who have hurt other people over similar things and what they tell me is, yes, I was loving. It's tough love. It's tough love. Love in the form of the hard truth. He's a sinner and until he gets his act straight, he just needs the truth. You see, there's... There's a tension in the way that followers of Jesus are supposed to love. There's a tension in the way that we're supposed to love because there is a tension in the way that Jesus loved. 
And if we try to resolve that tension, we will lose something very important. Maybe you felt that tension, the tension between grace and truth. Maybe your experience of Christianity at times has looked like my friends where you haven't really struggled to believe what you've been taught. It's just something seems off. Something seems not right. Maybe it has, it's kind of seemed like it's messy and inconsistent. Or maybe it seemed unfair or confusing. Because on the one hand, it seems like Christians are supposed to love by speaking truth. But on the other hand, it seems like Christians are supposed to love by giving grace. And so there's a tension. And there is a temptation to try to resolve that tension by choosing truth or grace. Or by choosing a much heavier measure of one than the other. Or trying to find the balance between the two. A little bit of this, a pinch of that. But... I need to tell you that if we try to resolve this tension, we lose something very important. If we try to resolve this tension, we will lose the ability to love the way that Jesus called us to love. Whenever you take the teaching of Jesus seriously, you're going to find that tension. You've probably even noticed it. Sometimes Jesus seems to be hard on people. And other times he's really gentle. Sometimes Jesus calls people sin out. And other times it kind of seems like he just ignores it. And so there's a tension. And we're all tempted to resolve it. But if we do, we will lose something very important. It's what people hated about Jesus, but it's also what drove his ministry. And so John, the same guy we read from earlier, in his first chapter of his book, he records about Jesus these words. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now, when he says the Word, he's talking about Jesus. That's one of the things that, that John called Jesus. So the Word was in the beginning, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were created through him. And apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. Life was in him, and that life was the light of men. The true light who gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Now, there's an important implication to that. If it gives light to everyone, that means everyone was in the darkness. All of us were in the darkness. Without Jesus shining his light, we are all equally in the darkness. And that's important when it comes to remembering how we're going to manage this tension of grace and truth. It says he was in the world, and the world was created through him, yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Picture that like an artist painting a picture, and there's little people in the picture. And then the artist finds a way to climb into that painting. And the people in his own painting don't even recognize him as their artist. So he was in the world, and the world was created through him, yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God. And the word became flesh and took up residence among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John says that Jesus was full of both grace and truth. And because he was full of both, he brought light into the world and forgiveness to the world. And that sounds amazing, but there's still a tension. Because there's an apparent conflict. On the one hand, grace seems to say, don't worry about it. While the truth says, you better worry about it. Grace seems to say, you're fine. Well, the truth seems to say, you're wrong. But Jesus was full of both, grace and truth. Not some grace, not and, and some truth, but all of both. The fullness of both, filled to the brim. 
And so John says, indeed, we have all received grace after grace from his fullness. For the law was given through Moses and grace came through Jesus. Out of his fullness. Fullness of what? Grace and truth. Out of that fullness, what do we receive? Grace on top of grace. In other words, Jesus was so full with grace and truth that it overflows into us and we receive grace and extra grace. And here's something that's interesting. It says that the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. The law was given like a thing for you to look at, to evaluate yourself on, almost like a burden. But when grace and truth came, it was begotten. That's what that word literally means, begotten or born. It showed up as a person. Grace and truth personified that you could see in front of you that when you're in his presence, you experience that grace and that truth, that overflowing extra grace. So what that tells us is that this grace and truth fullness is not just a thing that we aspire to like the law, but it's a way of being, a way of behaving. And when grace and truth personified in Jesus showed up, it changed everything. People left in darkness found light. People lost in sin found forgiveness. People who had lost hope found it again. But it wasn't the balance between grace and truth that made that happen. It was the full measure of both, the embodiment and personification, the flesh and blood of both grace and truth. And Jesus tells us that our love should look like that, the personification of grace and truth, that when someone is in your presence, they know that you hold a truth that does not agree with them, but they also experience a grace that welcomes them. And that's the tension. And if you resolve it by leaning on one or the other, grace or truth, you lose something huge. Because there's two realities in the way that Jesus loves. His truth convicts and his grace comforts. His truth convicts and his grace comforts. But because we feel a tension between comforting grace and convicting truth, we tend to try to pick one or the other. And I can tell you from my experience of a lot of time around Christians, we tend to lean towards the truth side. Because we have a really high regard for the word of God. And we say this is his truth and we can't compromise on that. And we get afraid that maybe if we get too full of grace we won't have room for truth. And maybe we'll start just kind of excusing sin as not really sin. And so we just throw out grace and say, well, if I'm going to pick one, I'm going to pick truth. I'm going to tell it like it is. I'm going to call a sin a sin. I'm going to call a spade a spade. And we pop off on Facebook about how some lifestyle or life decision is evil and wrong and bad. And then we distance ourselves from people who sin too much or, according to us, sin in the wrong way. And we become isolated from people who need us to be grace to them. We expect people to get their act straight before we'll fully love them. But here's the thing, and I can promise you this. If you live that way, and if you try to love that way, full of truth but not so full of grace, eventually you'll do the same thing to yourself. If you view people through a graceless lens, eventually you will view yourself through a graceless lens. You will look in the mirror and as a person of truth, you'll stare at your reflection and you'll say, I yell at my kids too much, I'm a bad mother. I work too much, I'm a bad father. I don't visit my family enough, I'm a bad son. I'm a liar, I'm a cheat, I don't deserve love because of what I did last night. And you won't be able to deny it because it's true. We're sinners, we're broken, it's true. And as people of truth, we look at that and we go, well, 
I don't know what to do. Because that's true, I can't deny it. But can I tell you something? That's only half of the truth. That's only half of the truth. That's only half the truth when you do it to yourself, and it's only half the truth when you do it to other people. Because there's more to the story. Yes, you sin. That is true. Yes, that person that bothers you sins. That's also true. It's true. We know it. But what is also true is that Jesus offers not just truth, but he offers grace. We can't be telling half-truths and claim to be people of truth because a half-truth is still a whole lie. A half-truth is still a whole lie. There's a reason why when, we, when we're sworn in as a witness in court, you know what they ask them. Do you promise to tell the truth, the what? Whole truth and nothing but the truth. We know that a half-truth is still a whole lie. So there's more to the story. The whole truth is that Jesus has truth that convicts, and he's full of that, but he's also full of grace to everyone who will receive him. And that's the whole truth. And the truth necessarily includes grace, because without grace, it's only half the story. Now, I want to also note that grace without truth isn't really grace either. We just tend to not... There tends to not be as many of us that go that direction, although there may be some of you here. If we go the just grace direction when, and leave truth behind, I just have one question. Grace for what? Without the truth that we are sinners, grace for what? We have to have both. We have to have both grace and truth. Then we find the fullness of what Jesus offers And we see this throughout Jesus' ministry. When Jesus met the woman at the well, he spoke the truth with her. He told her, hey, look, you've had five husbands. The guy you're with right now isn't your husband. That's bad. That's not good. It's bad for you, and and, and it's just bad. But then he, he had grace, and he offered her living water that would satisfy the desires of her heart that no man was able to satisfy. And then when Jesus met Matthew a hated tax collector who took advantage of people. He invited him to hang around him. And and people may have said, hey, Jesus, what are you doing hanging around tax collectors? Aren't you kind of like affirming that that's okay? Jesus would say, no, no, no. He'll get over it eventually. He wasn't worried about that. He said, he knows the truth. He knows it's bad. He needs grace right now. And then when Jesus was on the cross and one of the criminals next to him said, look, we're just getting what we deserve as he's speaking to the other criminal. And Jesus doesn't argue with him. No, you don't really deserve it. You didn't have this coming. He doesn't argue with him because it's true. That was the penalty for their crimes in Rome. They deserved it. But then he offers grace. And he says, I tell you this day you will be with me in paradise. When Jesus met the woman caught in adultery, the religious leaders were ready to stone her because of the truth that she had committed adultery. But Jesus knew the whole truth, which was that the men ready to throw stones were also sinners and that there was grace even for her. And so he tells her, I do not condemn you, grace. Now go and sin no more. Truth. You see this over and over and over in Jesus' ministry. And so we've said in this series that if you want to know what Jesus meant by what he said, look at what he did. So if you want to know what Jesus meant when he said, you're going to be known by your love, look at how Jesus loved. And the way that Jesus loved was that he was willing to call sin, sin. I mean, if he wasn't, he wouldn't have died for it. He died for it because he was willing to call sin, sin. But then he declared, I don't condemn you. I forgive you. I love you. Now leave your life of sin. But even if you don't, I still love you. Even if the sin runs so deep, your sin or somebody else's has affected you so much, you don't see a way to break free of it. He says, I still love you. 
I'm still going to work in your heart and in your life. That's what I'm here for. If you find yourself talking with Jesus, ask him, Jesus, what's true? What's true? And what you might hear might be something like, yes, child, it's true that you are broken. It's true that you mess up. It's true that you're a sinner. But let me tell you what's also true. The rest of the story is that I love you more than words can say. I have more grace for you than you could ever run through. It's true that I died for you. It's true that I want to be in relationship with you. It's true that you are hidden in me forever. That's the whole truth. That's what the fullness of grace and truth looks like. So if you want to be a person of truth, it looks like something so much better than just telling it like it is. Because usually just telling it like it is is leaving out the most important part of the story. Grace. And if you want to be a person of grace, it looks like, it's, it looks like something so much better than glossing over the truth. Because when grace meets truth, it finds power. And so that's how we've been called to love. To be full of grace and full of truth. To be grace personified so that when someone is in our presence, they're aware that we hold a truth that may not agree with them, but they also experience a grace that welcomes them in a real and tangible way. And there is a tension there. There always has been and there always will be. But if we try to resolve it, we lose something. Now, some of you might be asking, but George, isn't repentance really important for grace? Yeah, yes. But let me tell you what what Romans chapter 2 says. It says, therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. In other words, those of you who love to be truth tellers and tell it like it is, are, are, are you telling it like it is about yourself? Because, because you practice the same things. And he says, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? So what leads you to repentance? It's God's kindness. Think about that. We're talking about the God of the universe who utters and galaxies explode into existence. We're talking about a God who quite literally and frankly does not owe me or you any kindness. He could choose to put his thumb on us and force us into repentance, crushing us with his goodness, his his higher and superior morality. But he doesn't. He woos us to repentance. He woos us to grace. He sings a song over us to bring us into his presence. It's his kindness that brings us to repentance. Instead of making us prove repentance, he cultivates repentance in us through undeserved kindness. Friends, that is amazing grace. And what Jesus tells us is that people will know that we're his followers if we love that same way. Have you ever heard the phrase, you catch more flies with honey than vinegar? It's true when it comes to living like Jesus too. Imagine what it would look like if everyone who called themselves Christians loved like that. Like always, no matter what, no matter who. Even if it's your kids or your spouse or your neighbor or your crazy Uncle Joe. No matter who it is, what if we loved like that? How many broken relationships might be restored? How many lost hopes might be recovered? How many broken hearts might be healed, insecurities helped, fears answered? How many souls would find forgiveness in Jesus if we loved full of grace and truth? Because it is an amazing grace. And the truth is that a broken and sinful person that we might want to speak the truth over is just called human, and we're one of them. But what do we, what do we call a group of broken and sinful people who are maybe um, lying, 
cheating, adulterous, slanderous, covetous people. What do we call it when all those people get together in a place and they choose to love full of grace and truth? We call that the church. And the church full of broken people like me and like you, it only works if we do it full of grace and truth. It falls apart any other way. And when the church loves like Jesus, full of grace and truth, lives are changed and people find peace with God themselves and with others. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Dear God, thank you for your word and your example of what it looks like to love full of grace and truth. I thank you that you don't love us with just grace or just truth, but the fullness of both and that the result of that is that we receive an amazing grace upon grace. Help us to live like that. But more than that, help us to receive that grace from you. Work in our hearts a deeper understanding of just how incredible your love is for us. That you would step into our world even though we have a hard time recognizing you sometimes. That you would step in and just woo us with your kindness and with your grace. Be with us as we try to love our neighbors this week. It's in your name I pray. Amen.